Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us here today at the 2024 Towards an Anti-Ableist Academy Conference. I am Stephanie Peck. I am one of two LSA faculty and staff disability navigators. It's a pleasure being able to introduce um, this workshop with you today. A few announcements before we get started. Every session will be recorded and posted to the Towards an Anti-Ableist Academy website as soon as possible. Uh, the link should now be in the chat. All slides and any supplementary materials will also be posted in the session's Google Drive. And the link for this will also be in the chat. Any participation is completely optional. Chat will be disabled during this presentation to support screen reader access, but feel free to ask the presenter any questions using the Q&A feature. At the end of the session, we'll pull any unanswered questions into a separate document and answer them asynchronously. Please be respectful of anyone you interact with uh, today. And without any further ado, please welcome Selmia Gupta talking about lessons learned from the voices of students with disabilities. Hey everyone, this is Samia. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and get that started. How's that looking? Is that looking good for everyone? Until I hear any dissenters, I will assume that it is. Um, well, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, my name is Samya. I use my name or any pronouns, and I am a South Asian person in my mid-20s. Um, I'm wearing, I have short shoulder-length dark hair, black headphones over my ears, um, colorful glasses, and I'm wearing an orange top with black sparkles to kind of, you know, bring the Halloween spirit. Um, and welcome to my session titled Lessons Learned from the Voices of Students with Disabilities. Today, I wanted to share some results from a survey I conducted of students with disabilities last fall, but I wanted to use those results to open a larger conversation about academic accessibility and about what, from a student perspective, needs to change in order to achieve true accessibility that goes beyond accommodations. Okay, so throughout this presentation, I want each of you to ask yourselves, what does true accessibility look like? And think about it in the context of your roles. Think beyond what's required. Yes, I'm gonna talk a lot of research and data at you, but it will be your job to make meaning of it um, within the context of your role. Based on the amazing keynote speech from yesterday, it seems like we have folks here from every aspect of the academy. We have students, we have instructors, we have administrators and more. No matter where you work in the academy, it's really important to be aware of the challenges faced by students with disabilities and by all the staff and faculty who support them, including those who have disabilities themselves. Before I talk a little bit about myself, I wanted to talk about the office that I work with, SAAS, uh, which stands for the Student Accessibility and Accommodation Services. Our office has grown so much in the past few years, and a lot of folks on campus still refer to us as SSD, but I wanted to use this space to explain a little bit about what is SAAS as a whole. While accommodations are a really important part of our work, our mission is actually to lead the shared work to change perspectives around disability, dismantle systemic barriers, and provide individualized support for disabled students at the University of Michigan. And we envision an academic experience, a campus, and a world that values equity, accessibility, inclusion, and belonging for all. So this photo here is from our staff retreat this year. And even since then, our team has grown a lot. A lot of our members were brought to this work and to SAAS because of some connection to disability, whether it's having, whether it's having one or caring for someone who has one. And so our team is one that intimately understands the limitations of accommodations in making a truly accessible world. And so we try to approach accessibility in multiple ways. SAAS is actually comprised of four main areas of work. The first and perhaps most well-known is SSD, or Services for Students with Disabilities. 
This is the office that works with students to determine their accommodations. They can also help provide accessible technology, um, adaptive furniture, instructor support, and other means of helping implement those accommodations. We also facilitate accommodated exams and tests at the testing accommodation centers or the TAC. Um, these centers are meant to be a resource for instructors to help them in implementing testing accommodations. We offer one-on-one -on -one academic coaching and peer support, peer study sessions, and other resources through the Academic Support and Access Partnerships Program, or ASAP. And we're also home to the Adaptive Sports and Fitness Program, ASF, which just sent three athletes to the Paralympics this year. Woo! Super exciting. Um, on the slide is an image of some members of the ASF team with those athletes during our Paralympic send-off party. So... I just wanted to use this slide to kind of emphasize that while our office does cover student accommodations and is thus seen as a university compliance office, only about a third of our regular staff do compliance related work. SAAS as a whole is working to really change the overall experience of all students with disabilities. And now a little bit about me. Um, again, my name is Samia. I use my name or any pronouns, and I'm the project coordinator for SAAS, um, which is a relatively new role. It has only existed for about two years. Um, essentially, I monitor and evaluate the programs and services offered by SAAS, and I also conduct research in a few different areas, including what's on the slide, which is the experiences of students with disabilities at U of M, um, I also do research for a program called Prescription to Play, which explores the potential for adaptive sports and fitness participation as a bridge between the healthcare and disability communities. Uh, I also am personally interested, and I personally have a project about disability education and how to improve it for healthcare students and providers. And then I also um, am the backbone support to evaluate collective impact for the Wellbeing Collective, which is an institutional-wide effort. So that's a little bit about me, but a little bit more about me. So I added this slide in last night because I was inspired by our keynote speaker, Bonalyn Sweener, to tell my story and then tell the stories of others. The image on the left is of me and my freshman year roommate and best friend, Natalie. Um, we had a lot of penguins in our, in our Bates dorm room here at U of M and it needed to be documented. So that's the photo to document our penguins. <laughs> And I just wanted to use this as a chance to talk about my positionality to the research. Um, so I jokingly call this slide the me search interests slide. I identify as disabled, neurodivergent, as a spoonie, um, as queer and gender nonconforming, as a gamer, a musician. If you're Gen Z, then I'm a certified yapper. <laughs> um, I want to be polyglot. I'm taking language classes and also a penguin collector, apparently. Um, and some of these things, especially the first few things, are things that I realized while I was in college in dorms like this in 2 a.m. conversations with my roommate, Natalie, during college. So at the time, I was really struggling with what felt like the quote unquote normal student experience of grind culture. And honestly, I was burning out. Um, but because I had some professors who were really accommodating and some who were not as accommodating, I didn't actually put two and two together that I could benefit from accommodations. Instead, I just ended up thinking less of myself when I couldn't keep up. And while I never got accommodations myself during undergrad, I read about similar experiences in the responses that I'm here to talk about today from our students who do have accommodations which to me furthers the idea that accessibility goes way beyond accommodations. Um, college is a time of self-discovery, and that includes discovering what your disabilities are, what your needs actually are. So yes, while I work in an accommodations office, I really hope you all will see how the lessons I'm here to talk about today will go beyond that. All right, so thank you for for that for listening to my intro. Um, now I'll give an overview of the presentation itself. I'll start by talking about the methods of the survey I conducted, and then the results, which will include some quotes from students about their experiences, and then I'll end up with end off with some recommendations based on the lessons learned from those experiences. So starting with the survey methods. How was the 2023 SAAS student survey conducted? 
In fall 2023, I designed and conducted a survey of students connected with SAAS in some capacity, so I'll talk about that now. This survey was open for the second half of the semester, and eligible students were connect eligible students were anyone who was connected with SAAS in some capacity, whether it's having approved accommodations, having participated in coaching, or participating in ASF, or the Adaptive Sports and Fitness Program. Each student would see a catered version of the survey depending on the experiences they've had. So for example, if a student had tested at the TAC before, they would see the section of the survey that was about their experience at the TAC. There was an incentive to participate. Three students who completed the survey were randomly selected to receive $100 gift cards. Um, and this led to a response rate, which was about 28%, which for those who have done any kind of large scale institutional research, um, especially in higher education, 28% is really good actually. <laughs> Um, and my hope is to drive that number up in the future surveys by using these results to advocate for change and showing students that their results or that their responses can lead to change in that way. So the goals of this particular survey were to evaluate SAAS's programs and services and how effective they were at meeting their goals. But another goal was to identify students' needs so that we as an office could advocate on their behalf, which is what I'm here to do today. The plan is to conduct this survey once every four years. Um, even in designing this survey, I could feel the, the voices of institutional researchers in my ears saying, no more surveys, or there's too much survey fatigue. And it is true. I do think it's irresponsible to send the same survey to students without using the previous one to make tangible change. And so the idea is to conduct one every four years when many of the students have cycled out. And when you conduct a survey, you really want to be intentional about exploring every other form of data collection first. But when you're working with populations that have felt unheard by universities before, surveys can be, really be a way to encourage people to be more honest and also to equalize voices so that even the quietest ones can shine just as much as some of the louder ones. So that's a little bit about the methods of the survey and why I decided to do a survey to get this information. Now I'm going to talk about the results and I'm only going to show a specific subset of the results that I believe is relevant to this audience. Um, and that subset is what students are saying about their academic experiences. We would be here for at least 10 hours if I presented on all of the survey results. So I will actually only be focusing on two questions in this presentation. This next section might be the longest. So as we enter it, um, I encourage you all to try and see through the perspectives of the students whose quotes I share. I've been a student, I've also been an instructor, um, and now I work in an office that provides academic accommodations. And so trust me when I say I've heard and, and experienced many sides of the same story, but if you're an instructor or any other kind of role that supports students, please know that many students and myself understand and appreciate the hard work that you put in and that none of these results that I'm about to share with you are meant to be critical of, of your you know, ingenuity that you put into this work. What you'll find is that disability is complex. And if the goal is to facilitate a student's learning, there's still a long way to go past the bare minimum for students. And although instructors carry a lot of the legal burden of the ADA. When we're trying to think of accessibility beyond the ADA, we really need collaborations that happen across individuals, departments, and at the university at large. All right, so let's get into it. So the survey question discussed in this presentation is, how supportive were your instructors of implementing your accommodations? And while this is about accommodations, it was very revealing about student experiences in general. There is a quantitative portion that asks students to rate their experiences, and then there is a place for them to expand. So quantitative means numbers, qualitative means words. Um, so I'll talk about the quantitative results first, and then the qualitative results. 1,057 students rated their experience. And on the screen right now, you can see a bar graph showing those ratings. From right to left, it says that 65% of students said that their instructors were very supportive of implementing their accommodations, 29% said somewhat, 5% said a little, and 1% said not at all. So for the quantitative portion, 
94% of the respondents felt that their instructors were either somewhat or very supportive of implementing their accommodations. This is great. This honestly sounds great. Maybe I could end the presentation here and say we were doing a good job um, and there's nothing else to think about. But the limitation of this question is that we're asking students to rate all their instructors at once. And as we know, a student could feel mostly supported by most of their instructors, but still have some really negative experiences that can change everything for them. Still, this question about their experience as a whole is really important to us because it is about how the students are perceiving their academic experience at the university. So it is still important to, to get this number, but just to give some context of, you know, what, what the limitations of this question are. The purpose of this question is not to pat ourselves on the back, um, but it is it is sort of to paint a picture of like where we are at as a university and, and how students are feeling about most of their instructors. Currently, no significant identity effects were found. Um, this is me anticipating the question that's like, well, what of our, our, our students who have other minority identities, could those have skewed these results any, like, could these have skewed these results in any way? Um, and so I did do a multivariate analysis. No significant identity effects basically means that the presence of any other demographic did not end up significantly affecting these ratings. We tested this for race, gender, sexuality, first gen experience, first year status, different things like that. I wanted to go back and see if there were any significant differences between schools and colleges. Um, but that is really challenging because students will often take courses from schools and colleges that they're not enrolled in. So I think a different approach would be better for comparing schools and colleges on their approaches to accessibility, maybe in the future. So that's the, the quantitative results. Though there's no more numbers like that for the rest of this presentation. We're just going to talk about the voices of the students and what they wanted to share about their experiences. Um, so I did want to know about those experiences that stuck out to students, even if they said that their majority experience was positive. Um, so I asked them to share any experiences that they've had with instructors implementing accommodations. I did not ask for positive experiences. I did not ask for negative experiences. I just asked for them to share any experiences. And this question received 373 comments. And with those comments, I conducted what's called a thematic coding analysis. Um, for those who are not as familiar with qualitative analysis, I basically read each response and assign codes to those responses or basically what ideas are present in those responses. And then I take a you know step back and I look at all of these at once and try to identify themes that are occurring across all the comments. And so I identified that five themes um, from these comments that I will talk about today. And just so that folks know, it's not just me doing this work. I've worked a lot with the with the SSD coordinators and with other qualitative researchers on interpreting these results. All right. So now for the fun part. Thanks for sticking with me this, this far. Um, here are the five themes. I will go through each one and provide some example quotes that represent the theme. The themes are preference for acknowledgement and collaboration. That's theme number one. Theme number two is appreciation for going above and beyond. Theme number three is practical challenges with accessibility. Theme number four is experiences of bias and other discomfort. And theme number five is struggling with communication. So the first theme, which is preference for acknowledgement and collaboration. And what I mean by this is that when students have accommodations, but we can infer or perhaps hypothesize that also students who don't have accommodations prefer that their instructors acknowledge um, at least their accommodations and collaborate with them to have their needs met. So before I show and read some of these representative quotes, I just want everyone to know that students were made aware that their quotes may be used for this type of education and that their identities would not be attached to them. And so while I've selected some quotes, the ideas in those quotes were talked about several times throughout all of the responses, and that's why they end up making a theme. So if you read a quote and you're like, oh, that really sounds like this student, um, that really sounds like this student, then you probably don't actually know the student who said it just because each quote is representing many different students who had said similar ideas. So we're going to talk about theme number one again. So this quote says, 
Some professors have come to me to discuss my disabilities and try to accommodate as best they can. I have really appreciated the care that they took in talking to me personally before making assumptions. Other professors have ignored the disability information. I think having professors reach out about my accommodation letters has created more space for a conversation compared to when I have had to initiate the conversation. This is from a PhD student. So sometimes instructors will ignore accommodations until it is time for them to be implemented, which can be challenging. For example, the student might want to be able to predict how well that course will go for them before the ad drop deadline. There were a few students who actually preferred that their instructor not talk to them about their accommodations, but that was absolutely a minority in these responses. We always encourage instructors to at least start some conversation as soon as possible with their students about accommodations. It's important to remember that the instructor will know more about the types of activities that will be required in the course, not the student. So in a lot of ways, it makes sense for them to be the ones to start that conversation. The second theme is appreciation for going above and beyond. And I forgot to edit this later, but what I really mean is going beyond the bare minimum, going beyond the ADA. I understand that a lot of folks might interpret this as going beyond their job description, and that is an important discussion to have as well. But this theme is referring to when instructors express an understanding of the limitations of accommodations and they make efforts to create a truly accessible and inclusive learning experience for their students. So I'll give some examples of that. This quote reads, I really appreciated one teacher who was unfamiliar with the system to set up testing accommodations, but did her very best to set them up for me and other students who requested to use the TAC. And that was from a junior student. I really enjoyed this quote because it shows that a lot of students are understanding that their instructors and other staff and faculty don't always have all the answers and resources, but they're still appreciative of when those staff and faculty make efforts to find those answers. When it comes to using the TAC or the Testing Accommodations Center, the survey also found that some students preferred to use the TAC to meet their testing accommodations, but some also preferred to have their instructors provide accommodations. So this quote seems to suggest that an instructor tried to meet the requests from students to use the TAC and it was appreciated. This quote reads, the best instructors that I've had implemented unofficial accommodations because they were truly, because they were dedicated to equity, understand how broken official accommodations processes are, and truly cared about their students' well-being. This is from a PhD student. And I think it's really good to show that some of the best changes that you can make to your course are the ones where you value student well-being. Being accommodating in general across all of your students does not always mean that you're being unfair. While I don't know what this particular student meant by unofficial accommodations, sometimes that phrase can refer to flexibility and additional effort that their instructors show to care about their students' well-being. So that's a little bit about that theme. The third theme is practical challenges with accessibility. This refers to when instructors themselves experience barriers to implementing accommodations and other accessibility measures. There's a lot of different examples here, so I'm just going to use one quote or two quotes, and then I'll kind of go over the examples as a whole. So this quote reads, my instructors do not provide me with advanced access to class materials, despite it being an accommodation of mine. And this is from a junior student. This is a really common experience, actually, with students who have that accommodation that requires advanced access to materials. And trust me, as someone who just edited these slides last night, 
and also a little bit this morning. Um, sometimes we're changing materials on the day of, so it doesn't feel practical to be able to give advanced access to class materials, but not giving it still has a negative impact on those students. So it's really important. This quote reads, a lot of my program implements group work. It was very hard to gauge how accommodation would impact my schooling. We played it by ear in most cases. The burden of responsibility during a flare-up has shifted to my group mates, and that feels weird. This is from a master's student. And for those who are not aware, some chronic conditions, some chronic illnesses can lead to flare-ups, which are kind of episodic um, heightening of symptoms, like pain or like inflammation, literally. Um, and so it can often make it so that um, someone cannot be able to to work in this kind of way. So that's what a flare up is. And I think this is one interesting example of how a student's disability impacted their group work experience. I found this interesting um, because I remember in my own schooling having a lot of group work in engineering school and how it's meant to replicate the teams that you might have to work on in your future career. And it is an important experience to have, but we don't necessarily do enough to teach students how to actually navigate working on a diverse team. We kind of just often tell them that it's important to have diverse teams, um, but we really need to use this space as, a, as an opportunity to teach about flexibility and uncertainty that comes with diversity. And as a student, whenever we had student-led project teams, we were often understanding of different stressful situations that might come up for a team member and how we could help get that work done without making that team member feel like a burden. And as an instructor, I've had students had to last minute cancel on their group presentations because of an emergency hospitalization, for example. And situations like that are where we really need to demonstrate to group mates understanding and flexibility Some more practical challenges. I don't want to take too much time reading quotes related to all of these, um, but first is online course content, things like implementing testing accommodations on a Canvas exam. It's important that when you incorporate technology into your course, that you make sure you also understand how that's going to work for your students with disabilities. Another challenge is practicums or internships, clinicals, or study abroad. All of these experiences often involve organizations outside of the university or outside of the instructors. And how can we make sure that we can hold those institutions, but also, yeah, how, do, how can we make sure that we hold those institutions accountable for accessibility as well? This is not a question that I have an answer to, but it is a challenge that was reported. Any learning experience that involves a non-university entity, like those that I listed previously, but also guest speakers or external collaborations or partnerships, how do we approach the different standards for accessibility that two different entities will have? Newer pedagogies can also be a challenge. So students might have experienced like lecture style learning or didactic learning their entire university career, and then suddenly have an active learning course or a flipped classroom course, and that can make it a little hard because sometimes neither the instructor nor the student can actually anticipate what accommodations will be needed for that new pedagogy. So these are some of the practical challenges. The fourth theme is experiences of bias and other discomfort. A lot of students who chose to comment in this, in this um, or comment with themes related to this, reported experiences of bias and other discomfort. And these quotes that I chose stem seem to stem from a fundamental misunderstanding from their instructors of what accommodations are and what they are not. This quote says, some professors were fantastic at implementing accommodations. Others would make side comments about them, such as their personal belief that technology harms academic learning despite my accommodation. And this is from a senior student. I've seen a few versions of this quote that feel really similar, where an instructor's own perception of what is and isn't needed for learning is in conflict with the student's accommodations and needs. And this idea really demonstrates the challenge of trying to get an entire university's instructors 
on the same page of what an inclusive classroom looks like. It's really about paradigm shift, and that's something that's really difficult to accomplish. I mean, that is what we're here for, so that's good. <laughs> and this quote says, I've had to remind instructors of using inflammatory language such as some of them previously saying that they need to reread my accommodations, as some students have used them as a crutch before, as well as making statements regarding my concern for time on exams, that the time already given is generally enough for most students. And this is from a master's student. Now, although crutches and accommodations are both tools for access, I have a feeling that that's not what this instructor meant when they were making these statements. They likely meant it in a more ableist way, implying that either is something that is bad. It's also a pretty common but fundamental misunderstanding of accommodations to say that enough exam time is given for most students. The underlying assumption behind both of these quotes that I just used is that accommodations somehow limit learning. But we know that without accommodations, learning is further limited, if not impossible. So it really cements the idea that people with disabilities are not welcome in these learning spaces. All right, so, oh, here we go. The fifth theme is struggling with communication. And this theme sort of highlights what students themselves are facing. A lot of students understand that they have a role in communicating with their instructors as well, um, but there's a lot of struggles that come with that too. For a lot of students in higher education, this will be their first time experiencing disability or being aware that they have a disability, and that could mean their first time experiencing self-advocacy. Some students, despite having accommodation, um, despite having documentation of their disability and accommodations through SSD, are still coming to terms with their disability identity, and that can have a lot of impact on either their sense of belonging, community, or pride. So this quote says, I had the accommodation for extra absences, but I'm afraid to be absent because the instructor never remembers to change my absence to excuse, and it's very stressful for me. So this is from a sophomore. Um, and this quote brings up an idea that I saw in a lot of responses, which is that students are needing to remind their instructors continuously to follow through with their accommodations. And I cannot stress enough how important it is to set up your courses so that students don't need to remind you to, to meet their accommodations. Um, the way I spoke to it with a colleague of mine in SSD is that, or the way that they described it, is that the onus of implementing accommodations is on the instructor. And if the instructor forgets, then that onus falls back on the student. But the student has already fulfilled their responsibility in the process by notifying SSD of their disability and by, and by notifying them of their needs to acquire the accommodation in the first place. So it's important that the instructor fulfill their side of that responsibility as well. This quote reads, sometimes when talking to professors, it feels like I'm in a negotiation and it can be hard to advocate for what I need. This is from a senior student. And I recognize this one's a little tricky because we cannot always predict how a student will feel about a conversation with us after having it. Sometimes what you thought was a pleasant conversation was actually perceived as a negotiation. But what we can do um, to avoid this feeling of a negotiation is to ensure that our students don't need to prove themselves or prove their needs to us. All right, thanks for sticking with me through that long themes and quotes section. We are slowly reaching um, the end of this presentation. Something else that I wanted to mention about these quotes because last night I was trying to make sure that this presentation fell within the appropriate time. So I cut out some quotes um, that still represent different sides of these um, themes. When I talk about experiences of bias and discomfort, there are students who have experienced blatant discrimination in their classrooms, whether it's instructors or their peers laughing at them about their needs, or you know, when it comes to challenges with communication or struggling with communication, that theme, students really feeling like they cannot approach their instructor 
um, to talk about these things, whether it's because of a discriminatory experience or because they are new to this whole experience of having a disability. Um, so I wanted to make sure that this falls within the appropriate presentation time, but there are many more experiences that I was not able to, to kind of expand on with these quotes. Um, but thanks for sticking with me through what I was able to share. And now we'll talk about some of the recommendations that came out of this that I plan on communicating as far and wide as possible. I'll start by talking about recommendations that are related to accommodations, since that's what the initial survey question was about. But then I'll talk about the bigger picture the bigger picture recommendations that one can take from this, things that go beyond accommodations. So we're finally getting to the lessons learned about true accessibility. So first, it is important to acknowledge accommodations as soon as possible. If possible, collaborate with students to set expectations and meet their individual needs. Second, read the details in each accommodation letter. These are sometimes subtle, there are sometimes subtle differences between accommodations that are easy to miss. For example, there was one experience that I saw a lot where instructors would see that there's a testing accommodation and assume that every student who has a testing accommodation needs extended time. Extended time is just one type of testing accommodation. Students often have other types of testing accommodations um, as well. On the right side of this screen is a QR code and also a clickable link for those who are following along in the slides to the Accommodations Implementation Guide. This was developed by my colleagues at SSD. This may only be accessible to folks within the University of Michigan system, but if there are any folks from other universities who are watching this, you may consider reaching out to your own disability service offices to learn how to better meet students' accommodations. This is just a guide that addresses a lot of the frequent accommodation questions that, that our office gets. And finally, um, for this slide, I would say recommend, I would recommend um, collaborating with your department and facilities on providing appropriate spaces for students with testing accommodations. Um, because testing accommodations are a very common accommodation for the students who are filling out the survey, there were a lot who were talking about um, experiences of their testing accommodations not being uh, met appropriately um, due to challenges of having to move classrooms in the middle of an exam or move to a space that ended up being louder than anyone could anticipate. Um, so this is an opportunity for collaboration with your department and with your facilities. And this also goes for building accessibility issues, like students not being able to easily find classrooms because of lack of clear signage, for example, if they have a um, visual disability. So there's a lot of room for collaboration between instructors, departments, and, and building facilities um, to ensure accessibility. Also related to accommodations, um, work to understand the legal roles and expectations of students, instructors, and the SSD office, or whatever disability office is at your institution if you're not from U of M. Across the board, there are a lot of misconceptions about these. We have recently worked on putting together a document about these roles and expectations with feedback from many students, staff, and faculty to make sure that it was very clear. Um, this document is still undergoing the review process, but it will be available soon. So um, hopefully we'll have a way to make it easier for folks to understand these roles and expectations. I also said, collaborate with SSD disability access coordinators on making your course more accessible and also encourage students to bring up concerns about the implementation of their accommodations to their SSD coordinators. If you are a student or an instructor, with any questions about course accessibility, these coordinators want to know that. Um, there were some quotes that I um, that I admitted where a student even admits that while they went through this experience on their own, they didn't end up talking to their coordinator about um, about the you know lack of implementation of their accommodations. Um, a lot of students don't realize that their coordinators are not just there to approve their accommodations, but to also support them throughout their entire university experience in making sure those accommodations are implemented. And also, so that's related to if you have questions about the implementation of your accommodations, 
But if there are any experiences of discrimination um, that anyone is experiencing due to disability, um, of course, we encourage students, staff, and faculty to file those reports about discrimination with the Equity, Civil Rights, and Title IX office or the ECRT office. So that's what they're there for. And then these recommendations are more general and not specific to accommodations. So first is, do not ask students about their disabilities. If needed, for example, if you're trying to figure out how to meet their needs, ask them what would best help them meet the outcomes of the course instead. You don't need to ask them about their disabilities and they certainly do not need to prove them to you. So that we really encourage people to use this language about asking them what would best help them instead. And to the best of your ability, avoid singling out students who have disabilities. I think this is a practical issue that happens when folks are trying to meet the accommodations of students that they end up singling out those students in a classroom. And so there was some there was a quote that I admitted that was related to this, but that that was one recommendation that came out of this. Another recommendation is do your best to provide materials before a lesson, even if those materials may change. And that is related to the um the practical challenge of trying to provide your materials beforehand. It's okay if your materials end up changing. It's just important for, um, it's just important to be able to provide something to those students so that they have whatever they need before the course starts, so, or before the lesson starts. The next recommendation is to work towards making all of your course materials digitally accessible. Um, it is important for everyone to learn about digital accessibility. We are we are transitioning over to an era where everything really needed to be digitally accessible before, but especially right now, um, it's important that all instructors work towards making their course materials digitally accessible. Once you learn um, what goes into it, it gets easier and easier. I'm also someone who is actively learning digital accessibility every single day. And similarly, familiarize yourself with Canvas accessibility features. Um, this is related to, you know, having different exam times for different students, um, but also screen reader accessibility. Uh, I believe there's a whole series of workshops um, provided by U of M Canvas ITS team about accessibility. So um, that's actually a link that I did not give to the organizers to help provide. But if anyone is able to share that link to how to sign up for the Canvas accessibility workshop series, um, please share that. <laughs> um, Otherwise, I will look for it after and make sure it's included in the materials that are sent out. Next recommendation is think about ways to make your course more accessible for everyone, not just students with accommodations. I really want to emphasize that students with accommodations are a subset of students with disabilities. Students with disabilities are a much wider group of people. Um, and there are ways that accessibility that we know benefit everyone and not just um, students or people with disabilities. For example, closed captioning, often people will, you know, use transcripts to kind of look back at a conversation in a similar way that someone who has auditory processing um, challenges would also do the same thing. So there's a lot of ways that you can make something, you can make your course more accessible for everyone and not just students with accommodations. And then the final recommendation is to do your own research on ableism in academia and unpack any biases that you might have about success and excellence. And this is coming from really that fourth theme about bias and discrimination. We're seeing a sort of difference in how students and instructors perceive success and excellence and what it means to be successful. Um, and what I really enjoy about being in disability space is that everyone here has reframed what that means for them. And it's not that we're not trying to pursue these things. It's just that what it means for us is going to be some, something completely different. And um, so I just wanted to provide that as the last recommendation. So as we wrap up here and go into the next steps in Q&A, um, I encourage folks to share some strategies that they have used to improve accessibility in their own learning environments. Um, for those of you who have attended my Dialogues and Disability workshops, you know that I love learning from others, and so I really encourage folks to share information, resources, or strategies that have worked for them, um, and we'll do our best to, to um, save any resources that folks share. And thank you, Winter, for including those, those training courses. I really appreciate it.
some next steps for me um, is to one, create more spaces for conversations about accessibility with instructors. Um, I'm hoping that this is not the last time I give this presentation. I'm hoping to kind of like spread this word to multiple different spaces. And then again, I will conduct the survey again in four or more years just to see how things have changed over the years um, with all of the work that everyone here is doing to improve accessibility. Um, some other next steps are examining other metrics of disabled student experiences. Currently, there's a project um, where we're connecting the data that we have within SAAS um, with the university data to see how accommodations um, translates to student access and success. So that's one project that's going on. Um, since I'm only conducting the survey every four years, uh, the, the hope is to do other forms of data collection in the meantime. So something that we're interested in is a focus group study on disability identity formation. So really looking at how students who are in undergraduate um, education are thinking about themselves and their disability identities. This is a study that has been done in a lot of ways for the LGBTQ plus population. Um, and there are whole books written about LGBTQ plus identity formation in higher education. So something like that for disability, I think would be really interesting. And similarly, a focus group study on the impact of race and or culture on disability. A lot of our students are coming into the university with different um, understandings of their disability and different culture surrounding disability. Um, and so seeing what the impacts of those are so that we can better support students who are um, of any minority race who have a disability is really important to us as well. So these are some next steps for my own research. Um, of course, you can reach out to me whenever if you're interested in, in any of these or talking about any of these. So thank you so much for listening. Um, I will now take any questions. My email address is on the screen now if you would like to contact me directly. And I really appreciate you all for coming out and listening to me talk about these, these voices that we got from students. All right. Okay, here are some questions that I'm seeing here. One question is asking, since only a subset of data is being presented here, is there a way to get access to the full results from the survey? Currently, there is not, and the only reason for that is because full transparency, I have not completed that report yet. There are many segments of the report completed, um, but there's still data that I'm sifting through from this survey because it was quite, um, I tried to keep the survey itself brief, but the data was incredibly rich, and so it's taking some time to go through everything and create the report that actually visualizes it in, a, in, a, in an effective way. So there will be. And I'm hoping that the, you know, the network of, of disability organizations we have at the university will help me distribute that report once it's ready. All right, our next question says, working in a study abroad office, or by the way, I'm reading these questions um, based on what is being sent to me. I'm not actually looking at the Q&A. <laughs> I think all these questions will be addressed later. Um, so if it's on, if it seems like I'm skipping a question, it's because I'm not reading off like directly off of that Q and A. Um, so I just wanted to let you all know that. But this next question reads: Working in a study abroad office, it would be helpful to hear what some of the most common challenges mentioned with study abroad were. Um, I think I'm having to remember because this was not a quote that was included in this. It was a quote from the entire response set. Um, common challenges with study abroad office, and maybe um, I'm not sure if my colleague, if my colleagues who are in the call can kind of help with this, but essentially it's about implementing accommodations um, when you're taking a course at a different university in a different country. Over here, we have our own rules and expectations that are set by the ADA for who has what role when it comes to meeting accommodations. Um, but trying to navigate when universities across the world have different expectations for how to meet accommodations, um, that's the challenge is really like, how do we um, navigate the differences between, between U of M and anything that's not U of M in terms of standards for accessibility? I think the recommendation here would be 
Um, I mean, I, I'm just coming up with this on the spot, but a recommendation would be that whenever there's any type of study abroad program to kind of have that information about accessibility readily available would be really great for a student who has a disability who's trying to consider if they want to do a study abroad program. So where you're describing a study abroad program, having at the bottom, like, this is information about accommodations at this university, or this is information about... Um, accommodations of or accessibility features within the city itself. I think that would be really helpful to have readily available so that students can make that decision. This question reads, could you talk more about students who do not want to or are unable to get an official diagnosis and documentation? I believe this could lead into the unofficial accommodations point that one of the student quotes mentioned. Yeah, so, um, let me think here. So students who do not want to or are unable to get an official diagnosis and documentation, there there is a reason why the office only works with students who have official documentation. Um, but you know, speaking myself as someone who um, was discovering my disability in real time throughout college and was not able to get that diagnosis and documentation in time for SSD. Um, I, I, at the time, had really wished that, you know, instructors are given SSD as a resource to direct students to if they're reporting any kind of disability-related um, concern. And I agree that they should always, you know, provide SSD as a resource. I agree with that. I also think that instructors in general can make efforts to improve the accessibility in their classroom across the board. Um, and so there's a lot of ways to think about this, right? Thinking about your own course content um, and what parts of your course can be more accessible, whether it's the materials being more digitally accessible or whether it's about providing materials in advance or lecture recordings that you know students on Canvas can change the speed of or um, you know, scroll throughout the entire lecture, um, providing closed captioning for any videos that you're presenting during your course. There are a lot of ways that courses can be made more accessible in general that are not being considered because there's a, there's a, there's such a preoccupation with, um, accommodations being the end all be all for accessibility. I hope my answer is making sense here, but I think what really can be done is if all instructors have, you know, if we can really develop this culture of accessibility instead of just relying on accommodations to meet all accessibility needs. I think that would be one of the biggest steps that we could take to make sure that students who do not want to or are unable to get um, accommodations are still having their needs met. Um, and of course, as much as possible, um, you know, I didn't talk about universal design for learning in this, but the idea behind universal design for learning is to provide multiple options and to provide flexibility. And I know our keynote speaker talked about universal design in general. So really thinking about what parts of your course could have more flexibility, I think that would be really helpful. This question reads, were the students surveyed only those registered with SSD? or also students who are not registered, but still identifies having a disability? Okay, that's a great question. For this survey, it was only focused on students who are um, connected with SSD. And the reason for that is because the majority of the survey was really talking about um, the programs and services that they have experienced and how we can improve about, about those programs and services. But when I'm talking about, you know, next steps for research here and i'm trying to do a focus group study on disability identity formation or a focus group on impact of race on disability those kinds of things i'm hoping to go beyond the students who are connected with ssd and really try to um recruit from from the the broader pool of students who have disabilities or who identify as having a disability but for this particular survey it is only students who are connected with saas in some way Uh, 
All right. So those are all the questions I'm seeing. Were there any more questions? Okay, I, I'm seeing the questions that are filing in. Um, and these might be some questions that I include in the resources after. So we have about four minutes, so I'll talk about them. Um, someone is asking, can you point me to resources on the impact of disability and trauma? Um, I would have to do a literature review for that um, really quickly, but I do want to share resources about disability and trauma. Um, there's a lot of connection between um, between the experiences of having a disability leading to trauma, leading to trauma, and then the impact of that trauma on the same experience. So I do know that there are some pa papers about that, and I will do my best to find those so that we can add that to the folder after. And then someone else is saying, since I guess we do have time, could you please share some of the quotes you did not include? Let's see. Mm. Yeah, we, I think we can provide more details in the Q&A document for that as well. So the version of the slides that I uploaded um, did not include the quotes that I did not go over, but I would be happy to include those quotes as well. Um, I did talk about those ideas that were represented in those quotes um, throughout the presentation, but I will be sure to update that if people are interested in seeing some of those quotes as well. And then one question is asking, who do we contact if we are a graduate student instructor and have a complaint about our supervising instructor not following accommodations? I'm really glad to see that Alan Sheffield is typing an answer because I, I think that is something Alan can respond to. Alan is our associate director. Um, and my, my guess is that the answer is that they um, can contact the coordinator team with concerns related to that as well. When I said that any instructor or any student who has concerns about, imp about the implementation of accommodations can reach out to the coordinator team, I do mean graduate student instructors as well. And then someone is requesting resources on supporting students with disabilities who are also international students. That would be really helpful. I'll do my best to compile some of those and include that as well in the folder after. But thank you for, for bringing that up. All right. Well. I think that is all for today. Again, thank you so much um, for uh, coming to this session and for listening to these experiences that students are having at the university. I hope you will take it back to you wherever you work in the university to kind of advocate for advocate on their behalf for better accessibility across the board. Um, and I hope to see you all at other sessions. Thank you so much.